Okay, uh, good evening. We welcome to the latest installment of uh, Building the Scottish State. And I have the great pleasure to have with me MP Philippa Whitford with me uh, this evening to talk uh, about uh, health policy, about the current Westminster legislation, and also our views on uh, 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 independence going forward. So first of all, thanks to Philippa for being with us this evening. Uh, thanks for asking me. Okay, great, excellent. So, uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, uh, the, the the legislation that's going through. As, as, as uh, Paul was talking about it before the show, that it enables the the privatization of, uh, of parts of the NHS or all the NHS in England. Or uh, can you explain a little bit more about what the content of the legislation is? Uh, well, actually, the legislation that opened up uh, significant segments of the NHS in England to private providers was the Health and Social Care Act of 2012. And mm -hmm. some aspects of it, particularly the, the forced uh, outsourcing, the forced tendering of all services by GPs, meant that what you had was huge fragmentation. Whereas actually what you need in both health and social care is collaboration and integration. And so the NHS, people in the NHS on the front line, you know, they're the same all over the UK. They want to do their best. And they've been trying to kind of work around some of these obstacles. So they had kind of put forward, OK, we don't want a big revolution, but here's the things you could do that would allow us to work better together. And that's what this bill was meant to be. But in actual fact, what you see in it is instead of it being individual services that can be put out to tender, private companies can actually sit on the integrated care partnerships, which means you could have a private company like Virgin is in Bath on the board that's making decisions about where contracts are given for delivery of healthcare. So mm -hmm. to me, that seems a conflict of interest and looks like some of the private companies could actually be moving up the ladder and having a bigger impact. And, and the real tectonic shift yesterday was that the British Medical Association came out uh, with a vote against it. And they didn't even do that against the original uh, Lansley reforms, which drove all of this in the first place. And would that make any difference on the passage of the legislation? I mean, has it passed or would the opposition of the British Medical Association make a significant difference? Or are they just as, is the Johnson government just as impervious to, public pressure is, is, is he seems uh, well, to be. I think they're uh, uh, well he, he's not exactly open to listening um mm. it, it hasn't passed I mean yesterday was just the second reading so that's the very mm. beginning um all the committee stage and detail and so on will be done in the autumn um when we go back um so it, it, it has quite a long way to go but there didn't appear to be much support within the conservative benches for for challenging any of it and therefore i'm not sure that the that the bma itself is going to have a big impact in that but i mean there are lots of campaign groups um lots of you know keep our nhs public we own it save the nhs all these different campaigns will will be running and obviously some of that may exert some pressure on on mps but he has such a big majority it's hard to see it being stopped Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, tell us a little bit more about and would the, and would this have any effect whatsoever on the Scottish NHS or is it? I mean, is it pretty well separated so that it wouldn't have any bearing on any? Or are there some kind of knock-on effects uh, from funding and things like that that might have some effect on the Scottish? Uh, NHS? Well, the vast majority of it is meant to just apply to England only, but I think mm -hmm. that we always have to look now at all legislation in Westminster through the lens of the Internal Market Act. What in this could at a later date be used in Scotland? There are clauses that apply to Scotland. There are some aspects that are reserved. There's a lot of what are called Henry VIII powers at the end, mm. which basically mm. allows a minister to change this act in any way they like. And I think one of the concerns at the moment is around data. There is a plan to go ahead with a major data gathering in England of uh, people's GP data, gathering it into an enormous database of 55 million people, and then allowing that in a pseudo-anonymized form 
to be accessed by third parties. Now, some of that's the NHS itself or the equivalent of Public Health England, but they also list commercial companies like, like pharmaceutical firms. And the public have barely been informed, and most of those who understand it aren't happy. Now, a concern I have is the Department for International Trade has been advertising their foreign direct investment. You can come and set up your business here and have access to the data of 65 million people, which would be the whole UK. And so it, it really worries me that, uh, you know, they could use the Internal Market Act to, to actually try and seize NHS Scotland data. We're really quite far ahead in electronic patient records, data sharing, for, you know, within the NHS, but we don't sell it off to private companies. And, you know, to me, they, it's, it's trying to spot these tiger traps that are hidden within it. But mm -hmm. equally, if you remember in 2014, it was what was happening in NHS England. It was the fragmentation, the involvement of private providers that, that got me on my hind legs, got me speaking in the, in the independence referendum in the first place. So I also feel that even as a SNP spokesperson, I have to speak up for the aspects of this that are not going to make things better for the NHS in England, for mm -hmm. you know my colleagues throughout England who've been through a hell of a time in the last year and a half. So it, even on that basis, I spoke in the debate yesterday and I spoke very clearly against it. Okay, and uh, I heard that, 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 that evil, the English votes for, for English laws had been repealed. Is that the case? So was there a vote on that or was it more of a parliamentary maneuver that was changed or how, what, uh, what, what was the situation on uh, the evil? evil? Yeah, evil isn't law. It's basically, okay. um, you know, it's the standard operating of the house. Um, and, and that was ended a couple of nights ago. It actually hasn't been enforced throughout COVID simply because it would make the voting even more complex than it's been. Um, but they, yeah, they, they have got rid of it anyway. So I don't think they would have put this bill under evil. They might have put certain parts of it because there are aspects, there are several clauses that are UK wide and therefore we'd have had to be able to, uh, to vote on that. But, you know, yesterday we kind of, you know, this is, largely England only, it's up to them. I've spoken to about it. But once we get into committee and into the more detailed stages, um, you know, we'll decide as a group um, how, how we're going to deal with that. But I think the UK Internal Market Act literally changes everything. It gives mm -hmm. them so much power to, to interfere in devolved areas that we always need to be watching everything, as I say, through that lens. Okay, and and assuming they do, is there any recourse? Because normally, you know, there was the whole court case that uh, where they where they you know said that normally they wouldn't change anything without it, but you know they were saying, well, Brexit isn't normal, so of course we can change it. But I mean, have, has has any, has any of that happened and what, uh, yet? And do you and um, it, it would would the Scottish government have any recourse uh, against against that uh, the taking of powers? Uh, well, the the um, obviously they would be uh, asked, I assume, for a legislative consent motion. But we've seen, obviously, with the complete attack on devolution, uh, that legislative consent motions are now barely worth the paper they're written on. In that, uh, you know, we have withheld them, and the legislation has still gone ahead. There is a legal case, I think, that's going ahead or being considered around the data grab in England. Um, obviously, I think. This is one of the things that we need to be talking to people about. You know, far more people support devolution than are yet ready to support independence. And, mm -hmm. you know, lots of people, the argument against independence is, oh, well, maybe we can have a little bit more devolution. Maybe we could get control of, you know, immigration. Maybe we could get full control of, uh, you know, uh, social security, things like that. That isn't going to happen. They're unwinding devolution. And I think that we need to get the public to understand that if we don't go forward to independence, we won't be able to protect our parliament, our devolution, our NHS or anything else in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how would you uh, evaluate the different ways in which uh, England and Scotland have treated the coronavirus? I mean, I've seen that uh, Boris Johnson wants to leave all the uh, raise all the restrictions. 
<clears throat> and having masks be, you know, suggested but not mandatory, whereas it's a different policy in Scotland. Uh, uh, just talk, talk a little bit about the, you know, kind of the differences and in, 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 in your view, the differences of in effectiveness of the different policies. Well, obviously, you know, you have to understand the, the basic principle of what we don't have control of. We do not have control of borders. We cannot, uh, you know, enforce that you can't travel. We can't stop airplanes coming from somewhere. We did not control our money and they didn't allow the Scottish government borrowing powers even in the middle of a pandemic. So not controlling the money, not controlling the borders means that we always had to wait for the UK government to agree to do something like extending furlough. You'll remember all of that last autumn mm -hmm. um, when both Wales, Scotland uh, were, were in forms of restrictions that were impacting on business but the Chancellor was refusing to extend furlough. And then it was only when it actually started to affect London, suddenly there we get furlough. So, so we haven't had the, you know, the armamentarium that we would need, but the First Minister has been very careful, very steadfast in her management of it. And in particular, through that coming out of that first wave um, so cautiously, we had largely eliminated uh, COVID in Scotland last summer. We had eliminated over 300 strains. We got it right down to elimination levels. And the Scottish and Northern Ireland uh, governments tried to argue for, if you like, taking an elimination approach right across uh, the UK and Ireland, because mm -hmm. Ireland had also got down to low levels. And we could therefore have protected our external borders and been very strict about quarantine there. But then internally, like New Zealand and Australia, we'd have, we'd have been largely back to normal. And therefore, uh, just like the Asian Pacific countries that have taken that approach, we wouldn't have had the same economic or social impact. We would have saved a lot of lives over last winter. But we didn't have that power and the UK weren't interested. So we had Eat Out to help out in August. Then we had that Boris Johnson refused to lock down for six weeks after SAGE advised that. Whereas in Scotland, the First Minister came out the next day and said, no meeting in anyone's house. And if I had the powers, I'd be doing more. So throughout what's called the second wave, although it actually is two waves stuck together, the autumn mm -hmm. one generated the B117 variant. And that's what drove the very high peak then in, in January. And throughout all of that time, Scotland had the lowest case level, the lowest hospitalization, the lowest deaths. So throughout the second wave and at the, the height of the peak in Scotland was about half as high as England, Wales and Northern Ireland, which all reached the same levels of uh, nearly 700 per 100,000. So we managed much lower. Obviously, in this surge, unfortunately, and it's not so clear why it started so early in Scotland, obviously, the Delta wave, um, Scotland was the first up, but we're actually going back down now, thankfully, whereas England uh, particularly is now uh, higher than us and Wales and Northern Ireland are, are also going up. So I, I want to see our figures continue to come down. And mm. obviously, with what's happening at the moment, I mean, you know, England is surging. There's no question about that. Um, the people who are ending up in hospital now Yes, it's far fewer. It's 3% of cases will land in hospital. But Sajid Javid predicts 100,000 cases a day. That means 3,000 admissions a day. That's what we had in the first wave. So, you know, yes, it's a lower level, but you're going to allow case rates to rise out of all control. It seems madness. And taking away something as simple as masks that have no economic impact, or no negative economic impact mm. seems crazy. And for someone who's uh, clinically extremely vulnerable or a shielder like myself, that actually is going to make me what, sorry, what do you mean, likely what, to go out. What, what do you mean by a shielder? I, I don't quite understand. Well, uh, last year, if you remember, people with various health conditions were asked to shield. So they had to largely stay at home in the first mm -hmm. wave and, you know, not go shopping and, you know, certainly in the first wave kind of stay largely in their houses. Um, now, there's people much more vulnerable than me, but, you know, it means if, if people in the supermarket are all going to be walking around without masks, I'm not going to be going, you mm. know. So, so in actual fact, what it is 
uh, doing is it's excluding people who are extremely vulnerable. And there are people with immunosuppression who the vaccine doesn't work for. They don't mount a response. They're maybe under treatment for cancer or they have a blood system cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea that you're just going to write those people off so that other people don't have to bother with the mask. I mean, I'm asking to do to self to some protect the people around you um, and we're not getting rid of that in Scotland we're not getting rid of you know work at home if you can uh, so looking at all the things that we can keep as opposed to the prime minister who's just sending out the message the pandemic's over ignore the case numbers you know it's all good mm -hmm. Yeah. And what uh, and what powers uh, you mentioned uh, the, the 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 ability to, to, to you know, to close borders. Uh, what, what other from a policy perspective or, you know, powers could Scotland use it to, to better fight both against the, uh, you know, against the coronavirus and uh, economically as well? You also mentioned the powers of borrowing, these types of things. What, what do you think are the main powers that are the lack of powers that are inhibiting more progress? in recovering both from the, the you know, both recovering economically and uh, from a health uh, standpoint? Well, actually, you know, while the UK government likes to paint economic and public health as, uh, you know, a dichotomy, it's a false dichotomy. If mm. you look at those countries, as I touched on, that took a very strong public health approach and really controlled coronavirus, mm. they have had their society and their economy, their domestic economy, pretty much running as normal and therefore they haven't had the same impact. And, it, and it's going to be the same in the, in the recovery. So what people want, I mean, people have been brought to a standstill by this and, and they want something different. They don't want to go back to the inequality. They don't want to go back to the elites. And people know that we actually have to be in a different place by 2030. We need a different kind of economy or we're going to burn the planet. It's as simple as that. Now, yeah. trying to modify your economy when it is a speeding train is something that's really diff difficult. But because mm. it's all been brought to a halt, and it won't just bounce back, you will have to invest time, energy, and money to rebuild. You have mm. the choice of what you rebuild. And in Scotland, our vision is to rebuild a well-being economy, a fairer, greener economy. And the problem is that isn't remotely the vision at Westminster. No matter what they say, they want back to business as usual. And the problem is, with no, and, and that's going to hold us back. I mean, Scotland has enormous renewable energy potential. We have all mm -hmm. sorts of inventive people. We're an incredibly highly educated uh, population but you need the chance to invest in these new industries, these new energy systems, hydrogen production, putting in a smart grid, all the rest of it. And in these things were held back both by the powers that are at Westminster, yes. such as the cost of the national grid to Scottish producers and the lack of borrowing. It would be really cheap to borrow at the moment. Interest rates are low. So governments could borrow incredibly cheaply right now to invest in the infrastructure we need to be more green and sustainable by 2030. And we also want to make sure that that potential is shared more equally among people, because we know that societies that are where there's greater equality actually are more successful. Mm -hmm. So being the, the huge inequality in the UK is actually doesn't make economic sense. The government, by removing the universal credit uplift in September, by stopping mm -hmm. furlough, that might make, make their balance sheet look better. But our local economies, the places we live, it's actually going to take money out of them. So people won't be going shopping. They won't buy a new jumper. They won't be able to uh, go for it. And therefore, what you start to have is things start to shut. People start to lose their jobs. And it's the local economies that you want to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what uh, what has been the effects of Brexit so far? I mean, I, you know, I follow it quite closely, you know, the difficulties with the, you know, the supply chains. And I mean, you know, you worry about uh, like, you know, uh, food shortages or shortages of certain products. Uh, how, how is it in Scotland at this point uh, in terms of uh, uh, just, you know, like availability of basic 
commodities and and uh, uh, medicines, all of this, all of this stuff that um, Brexit has probably affected. Well, I think, you know, at the moment, the biggest impact is probably more on our exporters because obviously they suddenly had all of this bureaucracy. Uh, what we are beginning to see is the impact of the missing 100,000 hauliers. Um, and actually, a lot of those who, who drive lorries backwards and forwards uh, between the UK and Europe are from Europe. So they mm -hmm. would normally be delivering loads here. and then loads back. They yeah. can two sites in, and they face a lot of bureaucracy uh, on their way back. So, you know, there's a lot of drivers, European drivers going, well, actually, I don't want to load for the UK because, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just too much hassle going through the paperwork. And we don't have uh, so many whole years here because a lot of those who did work in the industry within the UK were European citizens and, and many of them have gone back home to mm -hmm. some things. I mean, I would say, you know, some of the fresh fruit and veg isn't maybe as good as it was. Um, but what we know is it's also things like not having uh, those who would work in farming, who would be harvesting, you know, strawberries and raspberries or, you know, working within the agricultural industry. My local, local fishing industry and their main catch is lobster and langoustine. 85% yeah. of this time. Yeah. Okay, you um, you've cut out for a bit. I'll I'll, I'll go again and get a couple of questions that I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, this ties in with what we're talking about. We have to differentiate between COVID health recovery and the economic recovery that Scotland will need in the future. Uh, what level of the ongoing virus? will be the time for the ref for, for the referendum and I think Philip has cut out unfortunately Uh, while we're trying to get a, the, reconnected with Philippa, I'll go over some of the questions. Um, uh, are, are the Tories cooking the books about the amount of people with COVID and with Wimbledon and packed at 60,000 most uh, games in Wembley? Will the figure get worse? Uh, Philippa could say more accurately, but uh, I would think, yeah, I mean, especially when you had the uh, uh, so many people at the stadium and, um, you know, at the at the finals and the other at the other and the semifinals. Um, when are we setting the date for Indy Ref Two? Uh, I don't know. I hope we can. I hope we can get uh, Philippa back soon to to to, to talk about that. Um, if you come up, uh, if you come into contact with someone that tests positive, and you work for Social and Healthcare Partnership, is it true you will not need to self isolate because of the low staffing levels? Uh, seen this in the Daily Record by Vivian Aitken. Okay, I'm on my own and he's trying to get her back on. So, uh, all right, so I guess I can. Um, so when Philippa comes back, I'd like to speak about the uh, the um, unease in the independence movement right now. There, there's, uh, because people are saying, well, we need to, we need to get other people along with us uh, and to, to, you know, to, 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 to convince people to vote. Uh, for, yes, when a referendum comes up, but at the same time, uh, a lot of people just don't know what the policies are going to be, and they're going to be uh, insecure or, you know, not uh, voting yes until they have answers to the to the larger questions that they have. Things like pensions and, um, you know, uh, the, the the currency, all of these, you know, big issues that Scotland will have to deal with. And uh, and I I think that the the whole notion of holding a referendum and then planning out constitution money all that i think it in my view it should be uh the other way around i think that the uh it it, it seems to me as if the uh the yes movement uh you know and the yes the snp unfortunately has been somewhat compromised recently for various reasons and uh as we see with the the advent of the alba um uh the, the alba party is kind of a, a reason you know the, the 
uh, you know, as, as, as a manifestation of that. Uh, but it's unfortunate that the the yes movement is um, is uh, is is divided as it is, and I don't think that it's over the desirability of having independence. Ah, you're back. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying another room. Yeah, I'm okay. just okay. Good. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. I've no, no idea no which end that was. Was... <laughs> he froze up there. So okay. Uh, yeah, a couple of questions. Um, uh, do we have to, we have to differ, differentiate between COVID health recovery and economic recovery that Scotland will need in the future? And what level of the ongoing virus will be the time for the referendum? In other words, obviously, Mickey Lesturgeon has said when, the, when it's passed, but what does that mean, you know, from a medical point of view, from a economic, I mean, it, it, I think that, and I think that's the source of a lot of concern about people because, you know, who, who you know, support independence and want to vote yes, but there's nothing tangible there and it just seems uh you know and 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 not having some kind of date or uh, is 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 worrisome so how, how would you address that question well I, I think we have to remember who it is we need to be talking to you know everyone mm -hmm. focuses on boris johnson's ability to stop us doing what we want but actually the reason that the thing that's holding us back is that half the population half the adult population of scotland don't yet believe in Scotland or believe in an independent Scotland. So I think all of us actually have a job to do. And, and it isn't about convincing those who are already convinced. It's about convincing the, the kind of maybe 25 percent people in the middle who are either utterly undecided or are soft no's or soft yeses. And, mm -hmm. and all of us should be working on that all the time in our conversations. From the point of view, what the First Minister has said is when the COVID crisis is passed. And, mm -hmm. and that does involve that you have to have COVID under control. You need to have case rates down. You need to have positivity down. And we don't have that at the moment. Um, so, I mean, it's not going to be this autumn and we need a decent run up to it. I mean, I would I would love it to be next year. I would love it to be next autumn so that we've got time to get on with it. But what I don't accept is the kind of um, Anna Sarwar argument that actually you have to get through the health crisis and then you have to get through the economic recovery. As mm -hmm. I said, what people are wanting is a, is a really different kind of economy. They want a fairer, greener well-being economy. And at the moment, we just don't have the powers to do that. We don't mm -hmm. have the powers to say, actually, we're not going to cut universal credit in the autumn. We don't have the powers to say we need to keep furlough going. So to me, until we have both the borrowing powers and the social security powers, we can't tackle the big issues in Scotland. So we need to get independence as part of being able to do that recovery, that mm -hmm. economic recovery. So so to me, I see them as, as interconnected. But mm -hmm. I think people have been literally shaken out of their normal lives by COVID. And mm. it's made people reassess what's important in life. And I think more people are, are conscious of, of looking for, as I say, real well-being. So physical, mental, social, economic and environmental. And we're, and we're not going to get that. That's the clear blue water between us and the Tories, between independence and being stuck in the union is that well-being economy approach. And what many people don't know is that actually it was the Scottish government that founded the well-being economy governments group with Iceland and New Zealand. Lots of people mm -hmm. here would know that Iceland had a well-being budget a couple of years ago, but they won't necessarily know that Scotland works to a national well-being framework. You know, we, we need to explain these things to people and explain the vision that we have. And mm -hmm. I actually think a lot of people would respond to that. Yeah, I, I but I, I agree, and I, but I think it's also you know the, the kind of the horse and the cart <clears throat> metaphor. But uh, it just seems to me as if <clears throat> if there, there would be it would be even if even in the absence of independence that there could be some real proposals put forward, uh, 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 you know, things like pensions, economy, uh, well-being, economy, and and put them out as you know basically things that you are voting for, and it needs to, and, and in my view it needs to be kind of coming from an official source, because if people just say, uh, you know, try, don't have mm. legitimate arguments to make, to be, not to say that they're illegitimate, but, but you know, that they're, that they're not solid enough, they're not anchored, and they don't know that it's going to happen. I remember my uncle before the 2014 referendum, you know, he, maybe he would have been open to it, but he was like, how much is it going to cost me? How much is it going to cost me? You know, kind of a narrow vision, but 
you can uh, but you can sort of understand it. So what do you think? It, what do you think the, the scope is for actually planning for independence before even a referendum that would help people have a better idea what independence would mean and would and would at the same time <clears throat> help convince more people to vote yes? Well, I think there are different groups that are working on this. There's some of my colleagues have been working on things like the defense vision for Scotland. Obviously, a lot of what we work on in the group in Westminster is more the reserved uh, aspects mm -hmm. and we work with stakeholders and we work as a group. So people are putting together the vision The a kind of proposal for a well-being and sustainability act it was actually in the manifesto. You know, Scotland is doing a huge amount around things like tackling poverty. Colleagues are doing work on on what our vision for pensions would be. I mean, pensions was thrown up so much in 2014, and yet the UK has the worst pension as a percentage of average earnings of the whole OECD. It's absolutely appalling. It's about 28% of average earnings. You look at some of the European countries and they range between 75 and 90% of average earnings. So we leave our pensioners in poverty in the UK. And then we had the WASPy women who had six years of their pension taken away from them, which is about, you know, 42 grand. So, you know, we keep getting these, oh, you know, this is really good. Well, no, it's not good. And it's not good enough. And when people talk about the economic argument, look at the economic impact of Brexit. You need to make sure that you're putting the long-term economic e impact of Brexit in the, in the you know, our column, because we want to reverse that. And that mm -hmm. this simply is the economic development of Scotland, and particularly our ability to generate and export renewable energy, to generate and sell hydrogen, you know, all of the different potentials that we have in, biological and life sciences and computer gaming and food and drink etc we simply don't get to control it we got nothing from oil and we're going to get nothing from the next energy boom which is renewable energy so to me we should be explaining those things to people i absolutely agree there's stuff that has to come up out uh, regarding currency regarding border management regarding our return to the eu but people are actually working on those things. And a lot of it, you can still be discussing with people. What is it's important to you? You know, what do you have now? We don't talk enough about what people in Scotland get that isn't available in England and Wales. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're really poor at kind of demonstrating, okay, here's what we do control through devolution. Here's what we've done with it. So can you maybe imagine what it would be like if we had all the powers and could mm. actually tackle what's holding us back, which is things like poverty and deprivation. Mm. That is the biggest challenge that we have. The biggest driver of ill health, the biggest driver of mm. failed economies is local poverty. And when you make cuts at Westminster, you suck that out of the local economy. And the local economy is where we live, where we do business, where we want to have a job, where we are successful, or where we fail. So it's the local economy. And that, you know, we know trickle down economics doesn't work. Trickle up economics is what works. Yeah, We're absolutely. never going to get that at Westminster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, and how do you see <clears throat> the, the route to that? Uh, you know, uh, as you, you correctly point out that we, more people need to be uh, need, need to be need conv be convinced, but also it, I would, in my view, uh, people need something tangible to 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 see. You know, okay, they're, they're, whether it be a date or an alternate means of achieving independence, and then that would get the enthusiasm up. But it just seems to, and now is there's we're just kind of in this, you know, kind of uh, you know, um, not no man's land. I don't know if that's the right word for it, but just kind of a uh, a situation where people, you know, they're undergoing uh, COVID. Uh, they've seen that there there could be a there was the Scottish referendum in sorry the Scottish election in May uh, that went forward why can't we have a referendum uh, you know uh, if if, uh, if that went through during the COVID so I'm just suggesting that I mean what is your view on how quickly another referendum could come about no you you can't I mean yes there was an election uh, and obviously I helped my local colleagues to campaign but there was very minimal campaigning. So, you know, there was no public meetings, there was no hustings, we weren't delivering leaflets, we weren't knocking doors. 
for trying to convince people for independence, you, yeah, you would just lose. You're not going to achieve that. So I absolutely would not support having a referendum now while cases mm-hmm. are, are still through the roof. And as I said, the people you're reaching out to is not the diehard people who already support independence. Mm-hmm. We, if, if we just based on them, we're going to lose. It's the people in the middle who could go either way. And they, their concern right now is COVID. Not even mm-hmm. COVID recovery, uh, but the COVID crisis. Once mm-hmm. we get through the COVID crisis, when you start to be able to talk to people about a well-being economy and what that could mean and what that could mean to them and their pension or their children, then that's when you start to inspire people about the basic principle, which is just that we would make our decisions for ourselves. So, Mm -hmm. you know, when they like to come out, oh, well, it will cost you £1,600 a person or you'll gain £1,600 a person. It is simply being in charge of yourself. You know, Mm -hmm. you wouldn't stay at home in your 50s. You you expect to become independent as an adult. And you know Mm -hmm. that you're going to have to do your own washing and you're going to have to pay your own electricity bill. But you would never think of going back home and saying, oh, well, you know, can you cook my dinner? It's ridiculous. We want to have the autonomy to decide what kind of country do we want to live in? How do we get there? We will make mistakes. It will be hard work. There isn't an independence fairy that taps us all in the head and suddenly we're all glittery. But suddenly we would be the generation that would have the power to build a better Scotland, a power Mm. that we've never had up till now. And to me, that is still the core principle of independence is us being able to get up off our bahookies, roll up our sleeves and do it for ourselves. And that is something that I think is much more inspiring to people than, oh, well, you might be £500 better off or you might not be £500 better Mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, Going back to the COVID, are uh, are the Tories cooking the books about the amount of people with COVID and and with Wimbledon packed and 60,000 at at many games in Wembley? Are the figures getting worse? Uh, Do you you see any level of deception or is it, uh, how, how how do you see it? I don't think there's a deliberate deception or hiding numbers. Obviously, what we know is that because of the relatively limited financial support for people who need to isolate, many people have not isolated. So studies have shown that. And there are studies carried out that suggested only 43% of people with symptoms were even getting a test if they, mm-hmm. if, you know, if they were in low paid or insecure jobs. So uh, the numbers, I think, will have been artificially low, but I don't think it's particularly government hiding them. And they are certainly shooting up now. I mean, my poor husband, Hans, has been doing the data for me every single day since last March, which is maybe why our desktop wasn't working tonight. But um, Mm -hmm. Scotland is coming down. We've been coming down pretty consistently now over the last five days or so. England has now soared past us. Um, uh, Northern Ireland and Wales are are also rising. Obviously, I want to see our cases continue coming down and getting them right down. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I think is critical. I don't think it's cooking the books, but you know it may come a point, and it has been raised in the House of Commons, the idea that they just wouldn't publish the numbers anymore, or they may stop some of the testing, and th- and those are different ways of hiding it. Whereas they don't epidemiologically, as, as Mike Ryan of the World Health Organization said, what we're seeing is epidemiological stupidity. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, question, um, if you come into contact with someone that tests positive and you work for a social and healthcare partnership, is it true you will not need to self-isolate because of the low staffing levels? Uh, uh, somebody, somebody uh, Vivian read this in the Daily Record, uh, if, you, if you know. Uh, no, if, if what they're looking at is whether um, if, if staff and obviously health and social care staff now should be doubly vaccinated, uh, care home staff, it's very much been with Pfizer, which is still giving really strong protection with the uh, with AZ. And obviously, because you work in that setting, then often you're in a position of having been close to somebody Um often with PPE. So there is discussion. It, it hasn't changed as far as I'm aware at the moment, but there is discussion as to if people are doubly vaccinated and working in those sectors, 
if they're protected. So not a case. If you're positive, you're going to have to isolate. But if you're a contact, whether you wouldn't. Now, that the vaccines are not 100%, um, and they're not 100% in preventing you um, carrying it and passing it on. So it's mm -hmm. a tricky balance to look at. But obviously, there is a danger of healthcare staff um, carrying it and passing it on, and there's a danger of the healthcare staff aren't there. Um, lack of workforce is a is a risky thing as well. So this is being considered, but only for doubly vaccinated uh, staff. And it may mm -hmm. mean that it would be something where they were more in, uh, wearing more PPE, wearing more protection. Uh, but I, as far as I understand, this has not yet changed. But it, I think it is under consideration. Okay. Uh, asking, we, we talked about this earlier, but should Scotland close the borders? Unfortunately, as you pointed out, the Scottish government doesn't have the power or the authority to show the they, they they have obviously public health measures they were you know we set our quarantine rule for scotland was that everyone had to go into hotel quarantine the problem is people who were coming from outside the uk were all landing in england uh, the uk government weren't willing to ask them to go into hotel quarantine there um, and nor were they willing to work with the scottish government so that we could have looked at enforcing some quarantine here and i mean that's part of why um, the travel stuff does end up on a four nation basis and in essence ends up following England because it's almost impossible for us to, to do it separately. Um, obviously, I wish we could have uh, closed our border uh, last summer when we had got the cases right down to elimination levels. Um, but un unfortunately, that is actually quite a difficult thing. And even as a, as a cordon sanitaire, which we would have the power to do, um, you saw, obviously, the reaction that you get and even the suggestion of it. So we had all the nonsense last summer. Why are you not following Boris Johnson? Why Why do we not, you know, why does Scotland not, do, not just do exactly the same as England? And bizarrely, considering England is doing something crazy, um, we still get the same language again. So we're in a, we're in a very limited space um, where the First Minister and the Cabinet Secretary for Health can kind of make decisions um, that that affect only in Scotland. And the problem that we have now is the media, there's so much discussion about everything ending in England on Monday. The danger mm -hmm. is that we will have people who think that applies in Scotland and it doesn't. This mm -hmm. isn't over. The first minister is advising people to be sensible. Level zero, while it might sound the same, is not the same as all restrictions ending. It still has mm -hmm. a significant amount of restrictions. So I think that it's important that we emphasize to people, pay attention to what the Scottish guidance and the Scottish rules are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. The thing I don't get is the English government is saying all healthcare workers should be vaccinated or, or lose their jobs. Whether you're vaccinated or not, you can still catch and transmit the virus. Um, well, you, you, you catch it much less if you've had um, both doses, uh, mm -hmm. particularly of uh, Pfizer, that reduces your risk uh, by about 80% uh, by, with uh, AstraZeneca, about 60 to 65%. So they, they provide quite a lot of protection, but it isn't absolute. But it is, it's care home staff uh, that they're planning to make it mandatory. Now, I I don't normally uh, speak in the debates on English COVID regulations because they only apply in England, but I'm chair of the all party group on vaccination at Westminster. And we published a report in May, uh, an inquiry we started in 2019, actually, looking into how you drive up vaccine uptake. Now, in Scotland, some people may remember the absolute hammering we were getting in January because we didn't have mass vaccination centers. England was getting vaccine numbers quicker than us. And what that was is that we were putting all of our effort into care homes, exactly mm -hmm. what the JCVI, the committee that advises on vaccination, said this is the number one group. We have 100% vaccine uptake of both doses by our care home staff. And that was because in Scotland, our chief medical officer, uh, his deputy and Jason Leach, the director of the NHS, they did webinars with care home staff to answer questions and concerns, to try and tackle some of the anti-vaccine uh, disinformation that was being targeted at care home staff. And also when we started vaccinating care home residents 
in the middle of December, we did the staff at the same time. So making it incredibly convenient, but also the solidarity of being vaccinated with your colleagues and also the vulnerable people that you look after. And so we got incredibly high uptake from our staff and therefore mandatory vaccination for caring staff in Scotland is utterly irrelevant. But it still is a problem. It's wrong because in actual fact, when you make vaccination mandatory, which they did the other night, and that's the first time it's been legally mandatory for well over a century, what you do is you actually increase suspicion and distrust mm -hmm. in some of the communities that are very hesitant about vaccines. And you can drive people who are hesitant to actually become outright refusers. And when I think of how hard care home staff have had to work over the last 18 months, to threaten their jobs is not the right approach. It's support, it's making it convenient, it's information, it's answering questions and putting in the hard yards to do that. We did that back in December and January. And I was on the media every couple of nights having to defend, oh, why is Scotland's vaccine programme failing? No, it's not failing. We're actually in there in care homes where for every 20 people you vaccinate, you'll save a life. That's where we had to focus, where we had to start. And that's why deaths in care homes in Scotland plummeted in January while they were still rising in England. So making it mandatory, I, I think, is I, I totally am against that. Yeah. Here in France, I believe that uh, the president just said that uh, made a thing that, that, that uh, you know, uh, encouraging people to get vaccinations and saying not, not, not making it obligatory. But if you want to if you want to go to like uh, uh, the movie theater or whatever, you have to have a proof of, vac of, of vaccination or a t or a recent test or something. Well, so, Well, uh, if, 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 if you're accepting a recent test or something, then that gives an alternative. But if you say that you can't engage in society at all, without some kind of vaccine passport domestically, then that's a version of making it mandatory. And, and anti-vax and vaccine hesitancy are much bigger problems in France and Germany than they are in the UK. We actually have a, a traditionally a very high uptake. Um, over 90% generally of people in the UK are pro-vaccine. You then have about 2% of people who are really against, they won't take a vaccine. And then you've got 8% of people who could go either way. And your policies have to be targeted at those people. What is it that's worrying you? And, and you know, what questions could I answer? How can I make it easy for you to get this? And the World Health Organization talk about three things, the three Cs, complacency, confidence, and convenience. Now, there shouldn't be much complacency about COVID and the damage that it's doing. But confidence means you need to give good information and you need to tackle disinformation. And then the third one is convenience. And, and with our care home staff, that's what we did. We tackled the disinformation campaign that was wickedly targeting care home staff. And then we delivered it to them at work, making it as easy as possible. They didn't do that in England. And there was a lot of talk at the beginning care home companies saying we're struggling to get appointments for our staff or they're being told they need to you know go 30 miles to a mass vaccine center bring the vaccine to them it makes mm -hmm. sense and and that's what they still need to do I, I don't support the idea of mandatory i accept that vaccine passports are going to be necessary if people are traveling overseas not that i would recommend people traveling much overseas at the moment um but doing it domestically there will be people who can't have a vaccine and to shut people out or, or to use those sort of intimidatory techniques. It's very attractive for politicians because you will get an increase in uptake when you make something compulsory, but you will actually drive some of those people that you might have convinced. They now become diehard anti-vaccine. And that means their kids are not going to get MMR. They're not going to take the flu jag. They, they just move into that refuser camp. And you made that happen. And that's not the right approach. Yeah. Uh, and what's the status of the furlough program? It's, is it being phased out now or what, what's the... Uh... Yeah, it's, it's already being phased out. So companies have to pay 10% uh, of the, the salary to staff. The government are paying 70. That'll go down another 10% next month and then it will end at the end of September. 
um, even though at the moment we don't actually know what situation we'll be in. And there will still be industries. I mean, even if we had a sensible approach to, to getting cases down and getting it under control, you know, the aviation and airline industry is not going to return to normal for several years. Yeah. Nightclubs and, you know, entertainment venues and things that are based on having, you know, thousands of people with their arms around each other jumping up and down and screaming and shouting. It's still going to be difficult. And because we have failed to take a global approach to this crisis, because we're not supporting poorer countries to get vaccinated, we will see more new variants that emerge in other parts of the world and they will eventually come back here. And so the whole pandemic is going to go on longer than it should have done. We had lots of warm words last spring about a global response to a global crisis. We haven't done that. And that means that this pandemic is actually quite some way from for being over in a, in a global sense. And therefore, there will be industries like aviation, international tourism, etc. And, and they're all going to be abandoned in September. And, and what we're going to see is universal credit being cut at exactly the same time as literally thousands of people are going to be made redundant. So this autumn is going to be quite horrendous economically. Yeah. OK. Um, uh, what might the NHS look like in an independent Scotland? How, how would how would it be different? I mean, uh, obviously, Scotland has a lot of powers to run it in, 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 a, in, a, in a more arguably, arguably more effective way than England, uh, and is and is hopefully is able to avoid the privatization. But what do you what do you what do you think some other changes could be made in an independent Scotland to the to the Scottish NHS to make it more effective? Well, I think um, moving more to that idea of well-being, so that mm -hmm. instead of uh, having that all you focus on is catching people when they fall, i.e. when they fall ill, um, mm -hmm. but looking more at, at preventing that in the first place. Now, Scotland has done quite a lot of that around children. The early years collaborative reduced things like infant mortality, the baby box, the best art grants, the early learning, all of these things are about investing in children. And we know that that actually has a big impact on uh, on their health in later life. It, it also applies to women, you know, mm -hmm. actually being healthy as a pregnant woman is is affecting the health of your baby when, you know, when they're born and when they move into adulthood. So we have quite a lot of that approach. The NHS per se, um, we, we already control most of that, but it would be things like research, be things like drug licensing, regulation of doctors. I think probably where we would see a bigger difference with independence would be in the care sector, because mm -hmm. obviously we have a vision of a national care service. The UK government are planning a green paper on the funding of social care. And what really worries me is that they may well consider proposing something like an insurance type model, whether it's government controlled insurance or whether it's private company insurance, uh, like they quote Germany or Japan. But mm -hmm. when I've looked into them, what you see is co-payments, i.e. the bits yep. that people still have to pay. My, my, dad, my dad went through that. My parents went through that. It was, it was you know, in the United States. Was, yeah. They paid a huge amount of money for, for, you know, for care insurance. And then my dad became increasingly debilitated and they had somebody uh, they had somebody come and take care of him, you know, for, you know, five days a week. And, uh, and then when he got really sick, they sent in, you know, several people who, you know, to help him with, with like minimum wage, not not at all qualified. And then and then at the end. But of course, it was much more expensive. And my mom had like a 30 or 40 thousand dollar bill at the end of that. Uh, you know, for for the for the end of life uh, treatment, the 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 low quality yeah. end of life treatment that he received. So I tell, well, I tell mean, him. I th <laughs> yeah, well, but I I think, and that's what worries me because obviously national insurance is is reserved, and I worry that we could get that forced on us. Whereas mm. it, you know, there's a proportion of people will end up in a care home. There's a proportion of people who will get care in their own homes. And obviously in Scotland, we're the only one of the nations that provides free personal care. And obviously the Feely report, which is, uh, has that vision of a national care service and taking a human rights approach to the delivery of care, because care isn't just elderly. Care can be people of any age. And seeing it about 
actually enabling people to still be actor, active members as, of our society, instead of always talking about it just as a cost or a burden. But at the moment, when you retire, you stop paying national insurance. So actually, just at the point in your life where you're probably going to use more health care and gradually a bit more social care, you don't, you don't pay in in that direct way that you did before. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, you know, I'm lucky enough, I will have an NHS pension. Um, you know, I wouldn't suggest anyone on a state pension should be contributing. But, you know, taxation is we all club together. And we all have the surety of saying, well, I might need a lot of help or I might be lucky and stay healthy and not need anything. But mm -hmm. I recognize that by me making a contribution, I'm getting that peace of mind and someone mm -hmm. else is getting that support. So to me, I, I'm really quite anxious about what direction the green paper might go in. But I think that we need to be having that human rights vision and it links with the Feely report vision of a national care service, of standards, of providing more at home. And obviously the idea is now that other than residential care, that other, all other personal care, uh, nursing care, et cetera, that, that is provided to you, um, you wouldn't have to pay for. So that we start really valuing the older citizens in our society. So from the baby box to free personal care, that's, you know, people used to say the cradle to the grave, but to me, it's the, the baby box to free personal care. And on the way in yeah. between is free tuition to use the potential of our young people, free prescriptions for, you know, people getting a bit crumbly. We should be looking after each other. And all of that contributes to this, the solidarity, the strength and the well-being of our society. And as I say, you know, Scotland was the founder of the well-being economy governments group. That vision is there. That's one of the things that we really need to be talking to people about if we want to convince them to think about independence, because the powers to deliver a fairer, greener, well-being economy is something we don't have at the moment. It's something Westminster has no interest in. So that is only on the agenda if we take control of our own decisions and choose what kind of Scotland we want to live in. Okay. All right. Well, what's uh, about time's about up, but just anything you anything you'd like to say in conclusion? Yeah, well, I, I think I mean my advice to people is you know let's all stop fighting each other within the the yes movement. Um, you know. The first minister, purely on her handling of the COVID crisis last year, took support from independence from 48% to 58%. And then unfortunately this year from whether it was the Alex Salmond committee or the various sniping that we're having between the different kind of sectors of the yes movement, you know, it's a well known fact that a house divided against itself doesn't win. So we need to stop expending energy on bickering among ourselves and start reaching out to those people who are in the middle, the people Okay, well I think Philippa uh, cut, uh, uh, cut out there um, so I guess we'll let, just let those be the concluding words so uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for watching, and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you next week.